House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan has subpoenaed former New York Assistant District Attorney Mark Pomerantz for his role in investigations of former President Donald Trump. Pomerantz declared Trump was, quote, guilty of numerous felony violations related to his tax returns, but resigned back in 2022 after DA Alvin Bragg declined to move forward with related charges. Now, Bragg res responded to Jordan's subpoena last night, writing, quote, the House GOP continues to undermine an active investigation, an ongoing New York criminal case with an unprecedented campaign of harassment and intimidation. These elected officials would better serve their constituents and their country by fulfilling their oath of office and doing their jobs in Congress. Meanwhile, a new CNN report confirms that the judge overseeing Trump's prosecution made donations to progressive organizations and the Biden campaign during the 2020 election season. Those donations, however, totaled just $35. Joining us now to weigh in on these developments is Emeritus Professor at Harvard Law School and author of Get Trump, Alan Dershowitz. Welcome back to Rising. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Professor Dershowitz, let's start by first just talking about um, the, 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 the central issue here, which people, even people who I think are really have a strong appetite for seeing Trump found guilty of some kind of felony, they even themselves admit that there is a rather tenuous legal argument here to get from the misdemeanor charges to a felony charge. Do you see that as the biggest obstacle that DA Bragg faces right now? Well, first of all, the people who say that are wrong because there is mm. no misdemeanor. Uh, you know, in my book that you mentioned, Get Trump, I go through each of the charges against him in all four jurisdictions. So let's start with New York, which is the weakest case. Here's the misdemeanor that he, uh, Bragg, lays out. He says that when a man like Trump pays $130,000 hush money to make sure that the allegation of an adulterous affair is never made public, he must then immediately make it public in his corporate disclosure forms. Has anyone in history ever, ever paid hush money and then made it public? Did Alexander Hamilton do that when he paid hush money um, to uh, back in, in, in the 1800s? It's never been done in the history of the country. This is an invented misdemeanor. I've challenged Bragg, show me a single case in history in your office or anywhere else where anyone was charged for not disclosing the fact that he paid hush money to keep an adulterous affair secret. He can't do it. It's totally made up. So there's no misdemeanor to start with. Then we go to the felony and you read the indictment and it doesn't give you any hint of what the felony is. In the statement of facts, it suggests there are three grounds for the uh, a felony. Uh, one, to prevent disclosure of campaign contributions, which is really a, a stretch. The federal government uh, campaign people did not did not prosecute. Then there's this other one that the New York Times says is the smoking gun, the most serious one. He claims that the reason that he didn't list properly the hush money was because he might have two or three years down the line wanted to cheat on his taxes. That's what he basically says. He says he put in an entry there. He wasn't sure. Uh, maybe the entry is legitimate. Maybe it's not. Maybe it was a reasonable expense. We have no idea that Trump ever took it as a tax deduction, but he argues that he may have made this entry to help him evade, what, $130,000 in taxes, which would amount to, you know, uh, an hour's wage for Donald Trump uh, if and when he paid his taxes two or three years in the future. I, in 60 years of practicing and teaching criminal law, I have never seen an indictment like this. So it, it's not that it's a thin indictment. It's a non-existent indictment. I went through every word of it and every word of the facts. I could not find a single crime, misdemeanor or felony. What about the other three? <clears throat> what about the other three outstanding potential indictments of Donald Trump? How do you view those cases in comparison okay. to what you call a thin indictment here? Okay. So in my book, Get Trump, I go through all four of them. So this is the weakest by far. Next, you get to Fulton County. There, the argument is we have him dead to rights. There's a tape in which he says, I need to find 13,000 votes. But find has a dictionary definition. It means they're there to be found. They're not made up. Um, what he was saying is there may be uncounted votes, as there are in many elections. Go find them. You can't prosecute somebody on that. Oh, they'll say, but he really meant make them up. But when he says something, you can't go beyond his words and say, 
that's what he meant, unless you have other evidence, and I haven't seen it. Well, there's, and there's, the District uh, of Columbia. Just to push back on that point, what would you say to folks who say, well, he said he want, he said, quote, I want you to do, what I want you to do is this, I just want you to find uh, 11,780 votes. Right. The, the margin of defeat was 11,779 right. votes. So specifically asking to find the number of votes that would close the gap of defeat for him yeah. doesn't suggest to some people there are an unknown outstanding number of potentially uncounted votes out there, but specifically yeah. I want you to look until you change the election result. What do you say to folks who say that that is um, that event is an intent to do something other than simply make sure the election is accurate, but to come up with votes to ensure that the election result changes? You're perfectly right. I'm perfectly um, okay to do that. I, I was one of the lawyers in Bush versus Gore. We were looking for 600 votes. Um, we were looking for it in Palm Beach County. We were looking for it in other places in order to change the results of the election. That's what election lawyers and that's what candidates do. You look for votes to try to change the election result. Perfectly normal, as long as you don't make them up, as long as you don't manufacture them or concoct them. And, and when you listen and there's to the no entire that he told anybody to do that. Hmm? And when you listen to the entirety of that Raffensberger call that went on yeah. for about an hour, as I understand right. it, and you hear Raffensberger coming back and saying, well, I just really don't think there's anything there. Some people hear that and they see Trump or they interpret what Trump is doing as leaning on him, trying to pressure him to come up with votes after he's already been clearly told there's no evidence that there are any outstanding votes or that the result that we've already had isn't accurate. What do you say to folks who perceive that to be uh, an effort at undo an illegal election interference? Well, and that's one of the reasons I don't vote for Trump. I don't like what he did. I disapprove of what he did. But the line between not liking and pressuring somebody to try to bring about a result favorable to him, there's a big difference between not liking it and it being a felony. And it's just not a felony. Uh, a person is allowed to push very hard election people and say, look, I think there are votes out there. You don't go look hard. He never said make them up. He never said do anything fraudulent. He said fine. And the dictionary has a meaning for fine. Fine is it's there. So I don't think there's a case there at all. I've heard the entire uh, conversation uh, myself. I don't approve of it. Just as I don't approve of the January 6th speech, I wish he hadn't made it. But he said in that speech, I want you to go and protest peacefully and patriotically. That brings him within the First Amendment. Uh, again, I go through all of these uh, allegations in great detail in my book, Get Trump. I just don't think there's anything in those two cases. The strongest case, illegally, is Florida, where he did uh, possess material that he shouldn't have possessed, but so did um, Biden and so did Pence, and I suspect so did many other presidents who left office and negligently took with them classified material. Now they're trying to make an obstruction of justice case there. That would be a, a reasonable case. But the possession of classified material is going to be very hard because unless they go after Biden, which they won't, and Pence, which they won't, the American public will perceive it as a double standard of justice. So I think he has a political, not a legal defense there. He's also going to argue, of course, that he declassified. And that's a question of fact. And what no one knows is who has the burden of proof on that? Does he have to prove he declassified? Or does the government have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he didn't declassify? These are all very hard cases. The one thing that's clear, his name was not Donald Trump, and he wasn't running for election. None of these investigations would be open. These are all examples of getting the man first, targeting the man, and then rummaging through the statute books and finding the crime. The whole thesis of my book, Get Trump, is that that is not a proper way to proceed in a prosecutorial manner. The greatest attorney general in our history um, uh, once said, um, any, any, any prosecutor can rummage through the books, Robert Jackson said, and find something somewhere to pin on someone if they target them and don't like them. And that's what's going on here. Uh, that's what happened when uh, Leverenti Berry, the head of the uh, KGB, said to Stalin, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. And this case has international implications. The, uh, President of El Salvador lectured uh, the United States recently in a tweet and said, you're going after the man running for president against the incumbent and you're lecturing us about democracy. You've lost all your standing to uh, lecture any South or Central American countries about democracy. You know, mind your own house. And this is not 
somebody who's a, who's a Trump supporter who said that. It's the president of El Salvador. So, you know, the idea that a district attorney can run in Manhattan on the campaign promise to get Trump, that's where I got the book title. I didn't make it up. It came from the campaigns of Letitia James, who I like. She's a very, very nice person. And Bragg, who I'm told is a very decent guy. But these people campaigned on that pledge. And when you I, campaign I, I on that pledge, you better take the promise. I agree, Professor, that it sets, it sets a really worrying uh, standard of politicization. And, and this is obviously unprecedented to indict a, a former president, and, and especially on charges that, as you just pointed out, at least out of, of this initial case out of Manhattan, um, are, are certainly not, uh, not very clear and not clear enough to, I think, justify breaking that standard. Um, but, but I want to get your thoughts on, um, on, on this Jim Jordan subpoena, right? So um, District Attorney Mark Palmer. Uh, there's a subpoena out now. Um, where do you think that this, this aspect is going to go, and what is Jim Jordan looking for here? Look, I don't like uh, politicizing by either side. Uh, the criminal justice system and the Republicans are doing it now back to the Democrats. Of course, Pomerantz will resist the subpoena, but I think he'll probably lose. I think he probably will have to respond. Uh, Congress does have a legitimate uh, claim to looking into something that has had an impact on our foreign policy. Um, if we can no longer hold ourselves out as the bastion of democracy, and if we are, you mentioned going after a former president, that pales in comparison with going after a current presidential candidate. Think about what this looks like abroad. You have a man, a Democrat, running for office on the promise that he will get the candidate who's running against the head of the Democratic Party. Then he searches through the statute books, can't find anything, and he cobbles together a fake misdemeanor and a fake felony, and he comes up with enough to uh, uh, convince 12 grand jurors uh, to indict. That surely impacts American foreign policy, and, and Congress has the power to inquire into matters of foreign policy. Should a local district attorney be allowed to run on that campaign? I have to tell you, I taught legal ethics for, what, 35 years at Harvard, I would immediately pass an ethical prohibition on anybody running for prosecutor ever to campaign on the promise to get somebody. That's just un American. Yeah, and I think Congress, yeah. It certainly feels like it would help his own case if he hadn't shown his hand quite so much in the, in the course of campaigning. But before we go, I do want to come back to this point you've made about it being a kind of fake or meritless um, misdemeanor yeah. uh, charge. I, you opened by arguing that it kind of undermines the purpose of paying hush money um, right. to have to report it. Uh, but I, And I think that is a logistical scenario that very few people will have to en encounter. It's a feature of campaign laws, but it does seem to me, even though there's these statute of limitation questions, and even though there's this question of whether or not you can fairly escalate the misdemeanor into a felony uh, using the uh, federal election law hook, uh, given the preemption issues, that the underlying business records fe uh, misdemeanor is, in fact, real, assuming that, that, that they could prove no. it and assuming that they um, hadn't uh, uh, ex exceeded the statute of limitations. Do you deny that there is a real claim at, at there that Ab that Trump absolutely should should absolutely not have deny it. when he reimbursed Michael Cohen, right? Not clarifying, not not accounting for that accurately, wasn't a business records violation. No, it wasn't because it's never been charged before. You know, there was a great cartoon showing Donald Trump in a store tearing off the tag on a mattress. And, and, and uh, Michael Cohen saying, oh, my God, we really got you now. Yeah, I challenge, Bragg, show me a single case in history, not only in your jurisdiction, but anywhere where a person was actually prosecuted for not putting down in his corporate records the real reason why he paid the $130,000 to cover up an adulterous affair. It has never, ever happened. It never will happen. Why would anybody ever pay hush money? And the, and the Why John would anybody Edwards example, have a non-disclosure agreement? Hmm? The, John, the John Edwards example doesn't seem germane to you? No, no, no. First of all, he got acquitted, and it sure, was a laughable. It, it was a laughable case. But uh, that uh, wasn't. Uh, uh, that was a direct, you know, a direct payment. And the question was: Was that a campaign contribution? It wasn't mm -hmm. whether it was a fraudulent uh, entry. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you. You can say it's a campaign contribution without explaining why it is. But what Bragg is asking to be done is to be very specific. Let's be very clear about something else. 
Donald Trump was extorted by Stormy Daniels. Uh, now, his lawyers will say, no, 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 it wasn't an extortion. We just said we would sue and make it public unless he paid the $130,000. If that's the case, then it's a legal expense. Then he paid the $130,000 to settle the lawsuit. Uh, the the uh, Brad can't have it both ways. Um, mm. and, and if it was a, 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 a legitimate payment, then it was a legal payment. And if it wasn't, it was payment for extortion. And I don't think anybody has ever, ever put down, oh, I paid extortion money. It's just, it's just not the real world. I went to Yale Law School. I'm a real, I'm a legal realist. I look at what has been happening in the past. Again, my challenge to Brett, I sent it out three days ago. I haven't heard. Show me a case. He said to the public that this is his bread and butter. He does this all the time, including sexual cases. Show me a single case where anybody in history has ever been prosecuted for not listing the fact that he paid hush money in order to prevent the public from learning that he had an adulterous affair with a married while he was married. It's never happened. So, yeah. no, I don't think the misdemeanor is a valid misdemeanor at all. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Dershowitz. Thank you so much. We'll have more rising right after this.